So uh, please give a giant round of applause for a lot of them. Hey. Oh, wait. Now I have to unmute this one. Hey. Um, I remember the first time I uh, had to uh, configure a, a Redis cluster in AWS. It, it, was, it was a humbling experience. It was my first time building this big system. And we were about a week before the release uh, of this uh, new uh, change to the Amazon search cluster. I used to work at Amazon. And I was naive. I was like, there's this junior engineer in my team. And we had some, some latency issues. So we said, OK, let's, let's add a Redis cluster. And I asked them to, to go and check what that means. And so he comes back a day later. And he's like, uh, I think we need to like put our system inside the VPC. And this is like a week before we release. And I'm like, OK, let's put the system inside the VPC. And then he comes back two days later. And we're like already three days before the release and kind of uh, becoming a bit stressed out. And he starts asking me about like CIDR blocks and IP gate and NAC gateways and uh, routing tables. And to me, this was great. You know, like I love this shit. But uh, then I realized that something's broken, right? Like we, we were trying to deliver value to customers. We were trying to create a system that helped solve a problem for customers. And instead, we spent the, la the next three days figuring out how to set up our VPC and configure our CIDR blocks and set up the NAT gateways and the VPC endpoints. And this was actually when the CDK was born. Like this project was uh, the project that uh, where you know we created this internal system that uh, the internal tool that helped us uh, generate CloudFormation templates because. For me as a developer, seeing, having this experience made me realize that we're not working at the right level of abstraction. And as a developer, you know, when, you, when, you're a, when you have a hammer, everything is a nail, I guess. And so as a developer, I'm, I'm, I need programming languages in order to manage complexity. For me, that's, that's the right tool. Um, and so hi, I'm Elad. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, this is a really, really, really cool group. Uh, I feel at home, to be honest. You know, it's my first time here, but uh, I feel I'm with my people, in a sense. So uh, really thank you for, for you know, inviting me and having me here. Uh, it was awesome to hear all the talks uh, yesterday and today. And uh, I feel like we're all kind of talking about the same things, you know, with different perspectives and different uh, 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 mental models. And so I wanted to talk about my mental model. Uh, Adam said, uh, art is how you see the world. And so I think like, this is definitely how I see the world. So basically, I think that the cloud is kind of like a jungle today. It's, it's amazing. It's this organic system. Uh, it evolves, and it's rich. And you can do everything. You, know, you can build everything you want. Uh, you can lean on services to solve some of the hardest problems. But it's a pretty hostile and intimidating place. Like we talk to people a lot, you know, new developers uh, trying to use the cloud and companies trying to migrate to the cloud. And I'm sure that all of you kind of under see this experience of, of people trying to figure their way out. I mean, they either have to be like heroes to fight the AWS uh, uh, monsters, the IAM roles, the VPCs, the subnet masks, uh, understand everything about 180 services. Uh, I like to call them, they, they have to understand, all. They, they know the incantations of how to connect a queue to a Lambda function. That's like, there's like three resources involved like dancing around. Uh, or um, if they're using Kubernetes, I kind of feel like they're like this. <laughs> Uh, they're just shoving their developers into a container and it's like, okay, you just don't care about the cloud. Uh, we figure out the cluster and all the things around it, but developers can't really use the cloud this way because they're locked into the container. Alternatively, you climb up to one of the vertically integrated cliffs that are Vercel or Render or Roku or you know, one of these amazing platforms and you're sitting back and relaxing, and you have this beautiful view, 
Uh, and every time you submit, you, you, you push uh, code to your GitHub repo, you get a glass of champagne with a preview environment and you're, you don't have a care in the world. You really can't deliver until you realize that server-side components are not necessarily the back-end you need for your mobile app, right? Because you're building a front-end thing and like something's not really adding up and you need to you know, do some big data analytics or something. And so you'd basically jump off the cliff and back to the ground and trying to find your way to the other side of the jungle, figuring out uh, how to do, I don't know, ETL jobs, which is, something that a lot of people need to do, as well as build uh, front-end applications. And, and I think this is kind of like the reality that we have today. And that's, that's okay, you know, like we've, we've, we've built this amazing thing together, we're still building it. I think all of us are trying to improve it and make it better and better and better. But this is not what, uh, this is not the end. This is not the end game. I think we're gonna use the cloud and the next 10, 20 years, that's, that's, easy, that's an easy bet. But I don't think that we're going to use the cloud the same way we're doing it today. Like, it's just too fucking hard. And, you know, I just talked to a friend of mine who's, you know, started, built a company in the past 10 years, and he's getting back to programming. And he, he complained that when he started his company, his uh, ser service was basically a server, you know, under his desk and with a public IP address, and that's all he needed. And now he can't even set up like a simple Node.js process on, this, on the cloud. Like something's, something's not right. And you know, I'm a jungle explorer. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I think like all of us are jungle explorers. We like, we like the jungle. We like to uh, open up the hood and understand how things work. But if we're not building the right platforms for the developers to be able to actually deliver, then we are not done. We need to work harder. And so I guess the question is like, can we turn the jungle into a park? That's, that's the big question, right? Like, are we able to take this hostile place that's not really designed for humans and turn it into something that's r as rich and as useful and that you can do many things in, like you can go, uh, but it's designed for humans, right? Like you can go to the park and play ball with friends or read a book or ride a bicycle or, uh, catch uh, fish in the pond, uh, but you're not in a dangerous situation. Your, your life is, your, is not, are not threatened. Um, and so I think the question that we're all asking ourselves one way or the other is like, can we turn this computing jungle into, into a park? And I recently came to the realization that I'm old. <laughs> Actually turned uh, 44 last week. And I've written code in the 90s, and I think a lot of, a lot of you also, which is really, that's why I, maybe why, why I feel like I'm with my people, because uh, sometimes when I talk to developers today, it's like they, their, their first programming language was HTML, or, or actually no, it was Next.js, that was their first programming language. <laughs> um, but I, 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 used to, I, I used to play with computers when I was young, and you know, I used to go to the, it was a jungle. It was a jungle back then. Like I used to go to the shop every couple of weeks and get another RAM card and push it into my PC. Uh, and uh, I asked for a sound blaster for my 15th birthday. That was, uh, was like so cool. Um, and I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I, I, I think I reformatted my hard drive like every, every week basically. I had like a little checklist and I set up my auto exec dot bad and like my menu and everything. But I grew up, and the industry grew up, and computing grew up and evolved, and today we actually have a pretty nice park in the, in the, in the PC world, right? Like, I can actually write a file without even knowing which file system I'm using, which is mind-blowing, right? Like, if I can write a file without even knowing which operating system I'm using, which is also mind-blowing. And so I think like being old is, has some benefits because you, you, you suddenly see the, what happened uh, and you're like, okay, we can, we can fix this. We can, we can actually get, get something like this jungle to become a park. And so how did we do this? Basically, we created abstractions. And one way to think about it is kind of like this line between, <coughs> between application and platform. Uh, when I started programming, my favorite thing was to build TSR programs, terminate state resident programs. 
who knows what TSR programs are? <laughs> okay, that's a nice number. So yeah, it, basically what you did is you, write some, you wrote some code and your program, when it started, it overread, uh, it basically wrote, wrote um, updated an interrupt vector of the CPU for the keyboard or for the timer. And it, when it exited, it told, it, told, um, it told the CPU to keep the program resident. So it basically the execution can, the stayed on, you know, the, the executable code stayed in memory. And when uh, an interrupt was ha happened, you know, when you pressed a keyboard or the timer elapsed, it called your code. So you could build these really cool background applications. Uh, my favorite one was uh, Sidekick. Who knows what Sidekick is? That's, uh, that's going to be a <laughs> nice. Um, and, and so back then, my platform was literally the CPU. Like I didn't even have an operating system involved in this ex experience as a developer. Today, I can't even do that because CPUs have protection rings and the kernel I can only do this from the kernel side. But I work at a very high level of abstraction. And so by creating a little calculator, I don't need to override interrupt vectors in order to create a calculator that runs in the background. And, and so we've managed to create these, uh, these higher level abstractions using two fundamental layers. One of them is programming languages, and the other is standard libraries, and obviously the operating systems that uh, we've, you know, that evolved over time be below them. And, and, you know, I've been talking to about this with a lot of people, and I think, like, especially in, you know, the the config management crowd and DevOps crowd, one of the things I get a lot is like abstractions are always leaky. They're not going to work. People don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. They're going to make all the mistakes, and and I agree. I think, uh, you know, I love this quote by Joel Spolsky. This, this is actually when, if, if, I know, if, I, if I understand correctly, this is when the term leaky abstractions was coined, which I think is this beautiful term. But I think it's really important to mention that whether abstractions are leaky at some point, it doesn't mean they're not valuable. It doesn't mean they're not powerful. And a simple example is like when you're clicking a mouse you know, a button with your mouse on, on your screen, you're basically using like 10 levels of abstraction. There's like 10 layers of things that are happening as you click on your mouse. And in your head, this abstraction is like, in most cases, very solid. Your, your head just thinks that, hey, I'm a, it's my finger actually clicking on this mouse. I don't even think about this cursor. I don't think about the rendering of the button. Like there's a lot of things happening. Sometimes this abstraction breaks if my CPU is clogged or I don't have enough memory or there's a bug and you know, the button is not getting clicked or my mouse is jittering or something like that. But for most cases, the abstraction is very valuable and very powerful. And without it, people wouldn't be able to use this, this, this application, right? And, and I think that's another really important thing about abstractions is that abstractions democratize technology. And, and I think it's something that we really need to kind of think about. Um, I think a really good example recently is uh, ChatGPT, right? Like, I think every, <laughs> every talk here had uh, talked about ChatGPT. I think ChatGPT is a really interesting one because you see how it's leaky, right? Like, look at this uh, <laughs> leaky abstractions uh, over there. Uh, but is it, pow is it useful? Is it powerful? Of course it is, right? Like, I made this deck with it. I even made the point with the, uh, with the uh, leaky abstraction. Um, but uh, but I, I th another really interesting thing about ChatGPT is like it's a really an amazing example of like democratization of technology, right? This technology was that was only useful for by only usable by machine learning experts became useful us usable by my mother, right? Like basically overnight, and and so I think we really have to re respect abstractions. I feel like uh, there's a there's a message here about um, respecting the power of abstractions and respecting the, the uh, impact of abstractions on our industry and on access to technology, right? Like being able to give more people access to a technology or a platform like the cloud, giving more inexperienced engineers access to this technology is a good thing. Uh, there's always going to be need for experts. There's always going to be need for people who will be able to debug problems in production and configure the JVMs and configure the, the routing tables. 
but being able to use this technology, um, but, but giving uh, more developers the ability to leverage this technology and lean on the cloud and leverage the capabilities of the cloud will improve our entire industry. So, as I said, I think we're, all of us are trying to do this uh, one way or the other. So let's look at where we are in the cloud. I think we're not in a great place. I'm look, just as an example, to, taking two uh, popular um, uh, programming models. One is Kubernetes and the other is uh, serverless. And <clears throat> I think neither really gives us what we want. With Kubernetes, developers as, are containerized, and so they can't really use a lot of the cloud. And everything is platform, including my API gateway. You know, like the definition of my API is that th that's not platform. That's like the application, right? The, the queues that connect pieces of my system, they're functional. They're, they're, they serve a function. They serve a business need. But developers can't really leverage them directly, right? Like they have to go to YAML manifests and update Helm charts and do things that are not natural to them. And if you look at serverless, it's almost the other way around. We give developers too many responsibilities. Right? And they, be, they have to become DevOps experts in order to be able to actually do something. And, and they have to configure Redis clusters and VPCs in order to be able to like, deliver uh, serverless applications. And I think it's really important to respect the fact that there are two problem domains. I think that, that was one of my, my blind spots uh, coming out of uh, AWS is that everybody at AWS is a DevOps engineer. Like all developers are effectively DevOps engineers, which makes total sense because the problem domain, the AWS is building infrastructure services. And so it makes sense that all developers at AWS would understand what, how network works and how you know, the deep uh, 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 infrastructure technologies work. But if you go to Airbnb, it doesn't make sense that the developer would understand how networking works, right? Like that's not really required because their problem domain is the problem domain of renting spaces, not the problem domain of, of the infrastructure. And so I think um, it's really important to respect the fact that we have two problem domains when we're delivering to the cloud. We have the problem domain of the platform. I think most of the people sitting here are, this is their passion, that this is the problem domain that they're enjoying problem solving in. And we have the problem domain of the business, which is where developers need to problem solve. And so putting this line in the, in the right place is where wing, Wingling uh, comes in. And so basically, that's what we're trying to do with Wingling. It's, uh, it's a programming language and a standard library. It's basically filling out this uh, line that, that connects application and platform in, the right, in, in, in a better model. Uh, we first released it in uh, December 2000, like basically a year ago. It's still not 1.0, so it's uh, early days and a lot of, uh, uh, lot, of, uh, um, lot of things to do still. It's built by an amazing team uh, that, that I wanted to give a huge shout out to and an amazing community that's starting to evolve around the project and um, uh, really, really enjoying seeing, seeing this activity and this... Uh, this, the amount of love that goes into this tool. Uh, it's a strongly typed object-oriented garbage collected language. So it's like a standard kind of modern object-oriented language. You'll see the, the syntax is going to be really familiar. You're going you're to understand everything I write without me having to go through like, a, you know, a tutorial of the language. Like it's going to be very easy to understand. Uh, we have a batteries included tool chain pr uh, approach, which means that the tool chain is shipped with everything a developer would need. It includes a testing framework. Uh, it includes IDE integration, a compiler. Um, so it's kind of like a one-stop shop. You don't have to like, set up like 3,000 tools in order to get like, a simple application running. Uh, it interoperates with NPM and JavaScript. So it compiles to JavaScript. The runtime is JavaScript. Uh, we chose JavaScript because it's uh, the biggest ecosystem uh, on the planet, and it's also very popular in the cloud, in cloud development. Uh, the license is MIT. Uh, Adam was asking which parts are uh, open source and which, uh, which parts are uh, uh, not open source. And so the, the language and the SDK are MIT licensed and open source. And the Wing console, which is this development tool that you'll see, uh, that's a commercial, that has a commercial license. It's still source available, but it's, uh, it's commercial. Okay. The next question people get, the, the first question people get 
uh, what people ask us is, do we really need a new programming language? Obviously, I'm, I'm assuming that's what's in everybody's head right now. And the answer is always, has always been no, like to this question. And I think it's really interesting. I think like in every case where we had new programming languages introduced and in every case we had uh, new programming primitives introduced, there was always a way to express those ideas without those primitives. And I, I, I wrote a lot of object-oriented code in C and I loved it. I loved setting up the V tables and, and the calls and the, and the structs with the this pointer and the first argument. And it was great, you know, as I said, I'm a jungle explorer. So for me, you know, doing that is always fun. My favorite thing was like to write com, com interfaces. That was like, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was too hardcore. Uh, but then um, we invented object-oriented -orient programming. We, we added primitive to languages so the developers don't have to think about how vtables are set up. And, and it's true for, for many different examples, right? Like uh, async and wait was introduced in C-sharp. And before that, we could write asynchronous code. It was just a lot of boilerplate and glue logic and mental uh, capacity that, and cognitive load that, that was required. And Go introduced Go routines and Java introduced threading primitives and uh, um, Erlang introduced the concept of uh, multiple processes. And so for Wing, this is uh, the concept that we have in Wing is called pre-flight in-flight. And it's in a sense, the way I see it sometimes, it's kind of like an evolution of the asynchronous programming uh, uh, design. Um, one way to think about it is like when I'm writing code that runs on a CPU, right? Like traditional, I call them pr traditional programming languages. Then I write my code, it compiles, I get a set of instructions, and the CPU executes those instructions. And so in a sense, it's basically describing something on the time dimension, right? Like it's basically a description over time. But when I'm building cloud applications, I also have a space dimension. I also have like an architectural m model. And my, my code is actually distributed, right? Like it's executed over time across different compute primitives, right, on the cloud, like on containers and Lambda functions or VMs. And, and so in a sense, with, when you're creating cloud systems, you have both the, the, the space dimension and the time dimension. And what Wing is designed to do is it's designed to combine these into a single programming model. So that's kind of like sometimes how I think about it. The other way to think about it is basically pre-flight is infrastructure, in-flight is application code. Um, or sometimes you even th you can think about it as compile time and runtime because preflight will be executed in compile time. And so luckily, luckily we managed to get to uh, the point where I'm starting to write code. So that becomes much more fun. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with preflight. And the reason I start with preflight is because preflight is the default programming space for Wing. It's it's a unique approach because in most cases, the default programming space is the runtime code, not the thing that runs when you're compiling your program. Like if I actually write some code here and I compile. Oh, I'm not sharing. Okay. Let me do that. Thanks for not letting me build the entire thing. With <laughs> Actually, <laughs> happened. <laughs> okay. Uh, size is okay. Tell me to dim the lights uh, so you yes. can see better. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically, if I do this, oh, it has to be this, right? Oh, it's still. Uh, Light theme is better? Okay. Let's not tell anyone. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm writing, uh, I'm writing my code. And it, interestingly enough, I compile my code, and this code gets executed. And so that's what I basically said earlier. Preflight is part of the compilation step. It's part of the compiler. And you'll, it, it'll make sense in a second. And, and, but the way to think about preflight and wing 
is basically a desired state configuration language, which are all words that everybody here likes, I think, maybe besides the language part. Um, but for all intents and purposes, you can use Wing, only use Wing pre-flight to produce desired state models. And in that sense, it's very much like the CDK. I, I built the CDK, and, and for me, Wing is kind of like the next evolutionary step. And so the, the, the foundation is being able to describe the infrastructure, describe the desired state of my system using a, programming, using a rich programming uh, model. And so I'll give you an example by, by basically bringing, bring, bring is kind of like the import for Wing. Uh, The, this is this, oh sorry, this is the CDK for Terraform AWS provider module and it basically contains all of AWS's um, resources and so I can create an instance. I can say okay let's create an instance and I have like all the documentation here it comes from from the CDK TF uh, code. I don't know, AMI is by heart, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure some of, some of you do. Um, and so let's do something like this. And when I compile this now, sorry, I need to compile this and I need to specify the target. And so when you compile Wing, you specify the target platform provider. And I think Adam mentioned it, early, uh, mentioned it, mentioned it yesterday when he talked a little bit about Wing. Uh, Wing has a modular backend, like very, like many other compilers, right? Like you could actually switch the, the different backends, and so same way as the C compiler can compile both ARM and AD, x86, uh, or compile both uh, Linux uh, output or a Mac output, then Wing has the ability to. You can basically create a, a backend to the compiler that determines things about the compilation target. And so the built-in platforms are TF AWS, TF Azure, TF GCP, current ones, right? Uh, AWS CDK, that's a CloudFormation output actually. But as I said, it's, a, it's an extensible model and anybody can build those, those backends. Um, I'm gonna use a Terraform one. And in this case, this actually doesn't really matter that it, it's an AWS because I could use anything in the Terraform ecosystem. We were just talking about adding like a Terraform, pure Terraform output. And I'm going to go to the target, and not very surprising, I have like an instance here. Now, one thing to, to notice is that this name was automatically generated for me, and it was, it's, it's based on the type of the object that I'm creating. Now, that's obviously not good enough for uh, desired state, because, for example, if I create two instances, then the compiler starts yelling at me because it cannot create another instance with the same name. And so Wing has the ability to basically specify the name, right? So I can basically say my instance and your instance. And now when I compile this, you can see my instance and your instance. Now, this gets interesting when you're composing things together. And, and I think the most important, Im important thing about any programming language or any programming tool is composability. I think like all, all of us have created frameworks and uh, being able to actually take uh, uh, building blocks and compose them into higher level abstractions. And so in Wing, we use this, you, we basically use classes to do this. So let's create a class that represents a fleet. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do, let's put fleet size and, and then I'm gonna do host i. So now I created this new thing called a fleet. It's no longer instance and I can instantiate it and I can specify, uh, let's create a control plane and data plane. Sorry. And now when I compile this, you'll see that basically Wing uh, used the full path of the resource inside my, my object to produce a unique identifier for the resource. And so this is a really important piece uh, of Wing that enables it to be, to be a desired state configuration language. This, this, this is 
uh, this is basically something that's uh, coming from the CDK, like this idea of being able to actually use comp uh, compose uh, objects together into hierarchies and still generate these deterministic and stable identifiers is, uh, is key to, you know, to anything in, in this space. And Wing has this built-in support for it. Um, cool. So this is just, you know, giving you an example of like the lowest level experience in Wing. Yeah, question? Two hundred and two. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, I haven't. I haven't shown it. Yeah. This is like. It's a big uh, terraform, and I can do a lot of cool things here. Um, I can also do things like let's uh, let's say I create a security group. Um, whatever. I'm not going to give it any properties, uh, and so now I'm going to do SGI, and I can reference it. So I can say security groups. And this is enabled by uh, CDK for Terraform. Basically, uh, we, because these, these objects are part of the CDK for Terraform framework, then they have this really, there, there's a lot of really cool support around like referencing things um, and synthesizing CD, uh, uh, Terraform output. By the way, there's also support for HCL output uh, that, that's coming up. Like we heard, we heard feedback about that. Um, Okay, so you saw the, the low-level experience of using Wing. Um, there are a bunch of examples. Uh, maybe I'll show just one more example here. This is an example using the CDK uh, for Kubernetes. Uh, again, the, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a CNCF project, actually, um, that we donated to, to CNCF. When Matt, one of the first CNCF project donated by AWS to uh, CNCF. I'm very proud of... Uh, the, the political maneuvers that needed to happen in order for that to happen to work. Um, so in this example, you're seeing the high-level experience that uh, CDK for Kubernetes uh, offers. It's called CDK Plus. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the CDK. Um, but it gives you this really nice high-level API for producing Kubernetes manifests. And so if I compile this, and here I'm going to use a custom platform for CDK. Uh, if I compile this, and I look at the output, I basically get uh, a, CD, uh, uh, <coughs> a Kubernetes uh, manifest that I can apply to my cluster. And as you can see, it also uses this, these, uh, these ideas of like concatenating, creating like these unique identifiers uh, to same, same, same ideas. And so this is uh, basically Wing as a, as, a, as a CDK or as a, as a desired state language. But now that we have these building blocks, we, are, we can actually create higher level abstractions. And as I said, the problems we're trying to solve are problems for developers. They don't want to create uh, Redis clusters and VPCs, right? Like they want to describe the intention of their application. And so Wing is shipped with a standard library, which is very similar to any programming language that's shipped with a standard library. When, when I'm using Node.js or Java, I have a standard library and part of the uh, uh, purpose of the standard library is to abstract the, the operating system, to abstract the platform. When I'm writing a file in Node, I do FS write file. I don't care which operating system or file system I'm using. And so with the same mental model, we're designing the Wing standard library to be a common library for cloud development. And obviously, it's the, the lowest common denominator, right? Like it basically it's designed around the idea that all cloud providers or all, all cloud environments have a bunch of building blocks that are going to be useful. And that doesn't mean the developers or, you know, cannot use resources that are not, design, not defined inside the standard library, like I showed you earlier. But being able to actually work at a higher level abstract, of abstraction gives some really, really cool benefits. One of them is being able to implement those resources across different providers. And so, for example, if I create a bucket and I compile this to TFAWS, sorry. Then, let's close this. Then, obviously, I'll have an S3 bucket. But if I compile it to Azure, I need to specify the location, whatever. And then now I have an Azure output and I see a storage container. Um, 
and, and, and these resources have some API. It's not a very rich API because they're, they're designed to give developers, they're designed to give application developers the right um, uh, interface to interact with the system. Um, so for example, I can specify the bucket is uh, uh, public. And when I look at the Terraform output, then now I have, sorry. Yeah, compile the Azure one. I have the magic incantation for making pub buckets public, which is, I guess, what we're asking people to do right now. <laughs> um, so this is the Wing standard library, and it's, it's, it's getting started. I think like eventually when we reach 1.0, we'll have about 20, 25 resources there. Uh, we're working on resources around streaming and uh, um, other cool things. Uh, but there are already pretty inter interesting things. For example, the website resource uh, will deploy to a CDN by default. So you just, you just create a website, you specify the path to your, uh, to your application, so you can say public, and you compile this, and this becomes like a CloudFront distribution with a bucket and more magic incantations on how to do this thing. Um, and so, so this, is, this is one piece of, uh, um, of the system that we're working on. We're actually making a lot of effort to, to test all of those contracts across all the providers. And so that's one of the heavy lifting that we're doing. 10 minutes, oh my god, nuts. <laughs> uh, we're doing a lot of heavy lifting to make sure that these APIs actually work across all the providers. And so you can, it's kind of like the testing philosophy where you don't have to worry about something that someone else uh, was worried about. Um, now let's talk about inflects, okay? So one of the types of res uh, in the Wing standard library, there's a bunch of resources that are compute resources, like functions and services. And, and they accept an input of like an inflight closure. Um, and so an inflight closure is basically, looks like a closure in traditional programming languages, only it has this inflight modifier in it. And it tells the compiler that this code is gonna run later in the cloud. <coughs> Now, before, sorry, uh, before I show you this, I wanted to show you another thing, is, uh, is the Wink simulator, right? As we said, uh, there's a bunch of targets here, and one of the targets is, uh, is SIM. And the SIM target is basically uh, a local simulator. And so we can take those APIs that we created in the cloud library and implement it using a local, a local implementation. And so, for, in, for instance, my, my little bucket here is a bunch of files in my fi file system, right? Because from a simulation perspective, from a functional perspective, I don't need the bucket to be highly available and, or highly scalable and like all those capabilities are needed for production. They don't, I don't need them from devel for development. And so now let's, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Oh yeah, that was a blue screen of death. I'm, I'm, I'm not even noticing that anymore, but it's, uh, it's how we show uh, problems. Okay, so now I'm going to add my function back, and you see, give me a second, something here is fishy. Unexpected JSON, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to... Okay, now I have a bucket and a function, and I can invoke my function, and I can see my log, which is great. Um, and if I compile this to AWS, it'll become a Lambda function and a bucket and all that stuff. But th so this is in flight. But the inter interesting thing starts to happen when, you're, when we're connecting pre-flight and in-flight, right? Like that's where, that's where the magic needs to, to go. And the, the, the first thing I want to show you is, um, sorry. Okay. And so basically I can do something very, very, very special, which is basically uh, lift, we call this lifting, right? Like we're lifting this string from pre-flight to in-flight. And the reason I'm so excited about it is because it's not that easy <laughs> to do. It, it looks super easy here, uh, which is great. It's, that's what we're trying to achieve. And you can see that it works. But it's actually not that trivial. And I don't know how many of you have tried to like share state, simple primitive state, like strings and arrays and maps um, between your Terraform and your containers or your Terraform and your, or your Lambda functions, right? And, and I've seen people do this in so many horrible ways, right? Basically, 
uh, passing them through environment variables, which is probably the least horrible way. I've seen them pass through SSM parameters stores. I've seen them pass through buckets. I've seen entire systems built just to be able to like pass configuration or state across these two spaces. And in Wing, you can just reference it. You can reference files and, and strings and arrays and maps and any type of primitive serializable information. You can just reference it naturally across those boundaries. You can also uh, reference other in-flight object, uh, pre-flight objects. And so you can also lift other pre-flight objects. And so basically what I can do is I can call B dot, and then I see, see a bunch of APIs. I see the, the usual suspects, right? Like the, the data plane API of the bucket. Uh, interestingly enough, if I do B dot here, outside of in-flight, I see the pre-flight API of this object. And that's a pretty unique thing about Wing. Like in Wing, every object, every class has both a pre-flight API and an in-flight API. And Wing has the context to understand what you can inter how you can interact with those objects uh, based on the uh, scope that you're at. Okay, so let's write a file. And as soon as I save this, you see I didn't have to compile, I didn't have to watch anything. Like it's just working as, as I want it to work. Um, and now I can invoke my, f my, f my function. I can see my contents of my bucket. Um, cool. So now let's build something. Uh, I don't know if I have, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Six minutes. Can I get uh, five more? How can, what do I need to do to get five more? Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I want to build a URL shortener, which is like a pretty lame example, but I like it because it's like, it's kind of like leaning on the cloud. Like if I just put a container that takes in the request and I need to start like scaling it, if like it, it kind of uses some, some uh, it has some properties that make it really nice to, to as a cloud, as an example for a cloud system. And so let's start by kind of jotting that out, I guess. I'm gonna create a cloud API, which is gonna be the API endpoint. And every time I do a get request, then, sorry, you see, I, I'm going to do the slash uh, CFG would go to config management get, slash wing would go to wing, slash whatever, that's the, that's the idea. And so I'm going to basically retrieve the alias here from the request. And so redirecting alias to something. And I'm going to return 307, headers, sorry, header, Headers, headers, location, and just put something here for a test, quick test. And, and so now I have like my little API, let's call this uh, data plane, right? Like that's basically where, where users are gonna hit, uh, no, not here, here. Okay, and I can actually test this. I can go to my browser and I get a redirect, great. Obviously, it'll also redirect to Wing for anything, right? Because I don't, and I can, I, I can also see that I uh, have like these logs emitting. Okay, cool. Um, so I've tested this manually, and now as a good developer, I wanna test it uh, programmatically. So as I said, Wing is shipped with like a, a built-in testing framework. And so I can basically start writing a test. So let's do this, right, HTTP get. Now I need the API endpoint. And always think, what happens in the cloud? Like, how would that work in the cloud? Like, I would need to de deploy an API gateway and like the API gateway would have a, a, a deployment and it would have an endpoint. Um, and we could just do API URL and you get the endpoint. Um, and so, and I'm gonna ask the, I'm gonna ask the, this to uh, redirect manual so it doesn't really redirect. And I can check here response uh, status, right? Let's, I'm gonna bring in the expect module. 307, and I'm gonna extract the location from the headers. I'm gonna do every, I'm gonna do it right. Location, and then I'm gonna expect, sorry, wingling IO location. And let, let's, let's make this fail for a second. So you see, as soon as I save this, I have like a little test and I can run it and I can check that it's failing, nice. 
and now I'm going to make it pass. Great. So I have a little test, so I know that this is not going to break, and I can run, run this test every time I change something. Um, and so now let's think about how, how to implement this, uh, this URL shortener. I'm going to use a bucket, and so the key is going to be the alias, and the, the target is going to be the contents of the object inside the, inside the, inside the, inside the key. <laughs> Um, so let's create a bucket, call it uh, mapping. And I'm going to basically say mapping.get alias is going to be the target. And so now, now basically this is expected to fail, I guess, right? Uh, because I don't have the because the target is not in uh, the, the target is not there. Let's see that it's yeah. It, it didn't return what I wanted. It returned uh, 500, right? Because the bucket didn't return anything. I can obviously like add some error, some nice errors. I'm not going to do it right now. Um, and so now what we want to do is we basically want to put just to to test this. I want to put uh, let's uh, do wing. And so now my test is uh, <coughs> sorry. My test is populating the bucket and uh, the request uh, reach. It, it's just too fast, I feel sometimes. It's like, this is really doing anything. Like uh, in the cloud, this would have taken me like 20 minutes for an iteration, like 10 minutes for an iteration. Go to the AWS console and dig up the logs and figure out what's going on there. And it's like, <clears throat> just that's how I, I want to build stuff. Um, okay, now let's create some control plane, right? Like I need to be able to actually create those, uh, those uh, uh, create those uh, sh shortened URLs. And so I'm going to create a class now. And I'm going to store the mapping object here. I'm just going to jump, take all of this stuff, put it here. And I'll tell you why I wanted to do this. OK, so now I have a shortener. You see that this is not compiling, obviously. I need the URL, uh, so make it public. You see that I, 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 don't, I don't have to teach you wing, right? Like I feel like uh, I, I'm assuming everybody understands what I'm doing. Um, OK, so here I'm going to create a shortener. And here it's going to be SURL. And now I need to be able to actually uh, create a shortcut, right? Like to create a short URL. So I'm going to create, I'm going to define an in-flight method here that will allow me to create a short URL. And so this is going to require the alias and the target. And it needs to be public. And here I'm basically going to do the put operation, right? So basically now I've added an in-flight API to my URL shortener. And so now I can basically call this call create here. And let's check that it's all working. Now you see that what happened is that now my system has this new thing, right? Like it has like a shortener uh, uh, a shortener object, and I can, you know, I can re I can do whatever. I can create uh, as many of them as I want because now they're objects, and so I can create two shorteners because that's a very useful thing, um, and uh, so on and so forth. I actually had some some other things that I wanted to uh, evolve this example. Oh no, no, there's one little thing that I wanted to add to this example is basically um, let's say we want to collect some statistics, right, and. So every time uh, there's a hit, I want to count something and return the list of uh, you know, how many times this was hit. And I thought about it, and I was like, I guess like, this is control plane stuff. It doesn't need to be uh, highly scalable. I don't even care if it's like, deleted. It's basically something that I need for the control plane. And the, my, my way to do this is basically to create like, a single container, right? Like just a single instance of a container. Every time there's a hit, I'm just going to go to the container and tell it there's a hit, and it'll count something in memory, and it'll give me a result. And so I've done that here. Uh, I call it a hit counter. And I've used a library called containers, which basically allows me to build containers with Wing. And you see that it points to a hit counter image. And so this is like a simple. Very, very simple Node.js application that just counts in memory. And it has the, sorry, and the hit counter has an API that, that says hit, and it will basically send a post request into the container. And there's an API called query, which would basically send a, a get request to the container and returns the results. And so now I can basically bring this, uh, this library, right? Hit counter, 
uh, and I'm going to instantiate that here. Sorry, I'm going to do it here. And when a get is happening, I'm just going to go and say this hit counter dot uh, hit with the alias. And I'm going to add another public API that says stats that will return a map of numbers, which is basically for each. Uh, and it'll go and it says hit count query. Now this is compiling. Uh, I didn't need the two instances. That's definitely not going to help my, and, and it's actually building the container. So it's like doing a build of the container one more minute. <laughs> uh, it's just so nice to see this working. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just going to print the stats, okay? That's going to be... I'm not going to build an entire API just for the stats, which is something that I wanted to do, obviously. Um, so I'm going to run this now, run this test, and you see the wing is 1. And if I hit wing uh, again, let's just do this. So now my test is hitting wing 3 times. And now we see the wing is 3. And this is just one little container because that's what I wanted, right, in this case. Okay, um, let me go back to this and just wrap it up. Where is this? Okay, uh, this is from Adam's talk uh, the, yesterday. Uh, definitely sharp edges still. Um, maturity is um, naturally an issue. We're still not in 1.0, but it's, we're working on it. And you can, you can see, like, I, I, can still, I can already build stuff with it. We're actually building a Wing cloud with Wing, right? Like, that's a big service that we're actually building with Wing all the way. Um, platform extensions are too low level. That's true. Uh, I haven't shown, I haven't had time to, to show you platform extensions, but... Uh, they're basically the, the, these backends that you can connect to the compiler, and we have some interesting ideas on how to make them higher level for, for DevOps engineers and platform team to be able to apply their concerns. Uh, there are some concerns around what we call accidental complexity, um, which is basically complexity that you don't intend, and so we, we think that we were able to uh, create a cost model, and there are other, other sharp edges. Um, you cut me off. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Uh, it was great.